Once more, friends, welcome to Foundation Church. My name is John. I'm the pastor here. And today we're going to continue a series that we started a couple weeks ago entitled The Good News. This is a series built around this simple truth that God loves us. That God not loves us, uh, not only loves us in words, but loves us in deeds so much so that he was willing to die for us. Now, throughout this series, we've been talking about what is that good news and why does that matter? But we continue to go back to the core of the good news, the, the base of it, which again is the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus for you. That's what I was talking about, that love in action, right? The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus for you. That's the very heart of the good news. But in the previous weeks, we've talked a little bit about what we're saved from, and we said that's ourselves. That's sin and death that leads from our, oftentimes, our poor choices. And we talked last week about what we're saved for, and we said that we're saved for life, not just life here and now, but life eternal. And this is incredibly good news. Well, today we're gonna continue to talk about the cost of that good news. What does it cost us? But before we get into that, I have to share just a tiny little story. So my oldest, Emily, went back to Oklahoma for college, and my wife, Crystal, got to take her, so they got a couple days, just the two of them, in the 100-plus degree Oklahoma weather, which was just amazing. They loved it so much. But one of the days I called and I said, how are you guys doing? And Crystal said, I'm really tired out. It's been a long day. And I said, oh, what have you been doing? And she said, well, we shopped for 11 hours straight. I said, 11 hours? What could you possibly be shopping for? And she was like, well, we went to this store for this and that store for that and this store for this. And we had to get all the things Emily needed for her apartment. And I was like, is is her apartment a mansion? Like, 11 hours. Now, I have to be honest, I don't like shopping even a little bit at all, I don't like it at all. So 11 hours is too many, one hour would be too much. But I do like stuff, right? Like I like things, I just want them to magically appear without shopping. And maybe you love shopping, and maybe you don't like shopping at all. But if I were to give you a $1,000 shopping spree, where would you go to spend it? Take a second, share with somebody around you or online people, share with each other down below. $1,000, where do you go? Okay, hopefully you had at least a second to begin to share with people where you would go. Maybe you heard somebody else around you give an answer and you were like, that, that's my new answer. That's where I would go. Here's... Here's the thing, I don't have $1,000 to give to you, so it doesn't matter. Like, unless you have $1,000 sitting around you don't know what to do with, this is, this is nonsense. We're just playing a game, right? But as a small child, my father did own his own store. It was Cottage Sports Sporting Goods in Owego, New York, and it had all the sporting goods stuff that you could buy at Dick's for way more money, but it was in the small town of Owego that my dad owned. And so as a kid, what that meant is I could go into that store and take anything I wanted. Anytime we wanted to go fishing and we needed a fishing pole, we'd just go to the store and take it. If we needed something for hunting, we would just go to the store and take it, right? And it was awesome. I remember saying to my dad all the time, Dad, this is amazing that you own this store and we get all this stuff for free. And he continually tried to explain to me, John, it's not free. I had to buy all this stuff. This, This stuff was costly to me. And I would constantly say back to him, yeah, but it's free for me. It's free to me, Dad. It's free. And that's the way grace works in our lives. That's the way the good news is. It turns out that this good news that comes from God through Jesus to all of us is free for all of you. It's costly to your heavenly father. It's costly to God. We'll talk more about that next week. But as far as all of us are concerned, it's free. And that is really, really good news. Now to help us talk more about this freeness of grace I'm going to be reading to you from your Bibles a a passage of Scripture from the book of Acts. I'm going to be looking at Acts chapter 16, verses 25 to 34. And I have to make sure you realize that I'm picking up partway into a story. And this is a really, really cool story. I would absolutely recommend that all of you, whether you have your Bibles with you today or you have a Bible at home that's dusty, that you crack open the Bible at some point today and read the beginning of Acts chapter 16. It's super cool. We're following Paul and Silas, two men who've been imprisoned. But prior to this, 
they're going around and they're preaching in the city of Philippi, right? That's the city they're in. And there's a woman who is possessed with a spirit. And the spirit continually causes her to proclaim things about Paul and Silas and the others that are with them about the living God whom they serve. And this happens for days, days on end. And finally, we're told that Paul gets annoyed. And that is a quote. He gets annoyed and casts the spirit out of her. It may be the only demon possession exorcism that happens because somebody's irritated with the demon. But Paul gets annoyed and casts the spirit out of her. Now, this woman was making a lot of money for her master. She was a slave. And she was making a lot of money for her master because of this spirit. And so he gets angry with Paul and Silas. And that's where we're going to pick up this story. But absolutely read the first part because it is super cool. Uh, and then keep reading after what we read today because that's also really cool. I won't, I won't spoil the ending for you. With all of that said, though, I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 16, verses 25 to 34. If you brought your Bibles from home like I did, we're going to turn some lights on so it's a little easier for you to read. If you didn't, that's okay. We'll put it up on the screen for you. About midnight... Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, "'Don't harm yourself!' We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought, brought them out and asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, then immediately he and all of his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. This is God's word. It's given freely for each and every one of you. So what a cool story, right? This jailer is convinced that he's in for it now. By the way, in, in Roman law, if prisoners escaped, whatever the penalty was going to be for the prisoner, that was the penalty enacted upon the jailer. And so, obviously, there were people on death row in there. That's why when he saw the doors opened, he said, I'm, I'm a dead man. I might as well do it myself before they get me. Uh, and yet, Paul and Silas and the other prisoners had not escaped. It's so incredible. I want to take you back to verse 30, though. This is about midway into the story. In verse 30, this is after the jailer has realized the earthquake has happened, the doors are open. He's, he's feared the worst, and he's beginning to kill himself. And then Paul says, stop. And here we're told that the jailer brings them out and asks them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And I want to highlight that word saved. Because it's odd that a jailer is asking a prisoner, what do I have to do to be saved? You would think it would be the other way around. The prisoners would be asking the jailer, what can we do to get out of this? It's because there's something so distinct, so unique about Paul and Silas. They were free and they chose to stay. It's so odd so extraordinary that he knew they had something to offer him. That word saved there, it can be rescued or it can be made whole. The point here, though, is he knows they have something that he doesn't have. They have something that he wants, and he wants to get it from them. I'm always challenged when I read passages of Scripture like this, where people encounter Christians, and then they say, how can I get what you have? Because I don't know about you, but I don't always have people walk up to me and be like, I want what you got, John. How can I be more like you? Once in, a, once in a great while. But not very often. And it leads me to believe that maybe I'm not living in, in an exceptional enough way. I'm not living in a noteworthy enough way. If, if we're too much like the world, the world looks at us and says, yeah, you're one of us. But if we're enough different, the world looks at us and says, you have something special. And that's the goal, Right? Now, the story doesn't stop here with verse 30. We go on to verse 31. We get Paul's answer. We're told that they replied and said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. I want to focus on that word believe. That's the same word believe that we talked about last week. 
when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he said, you have to believe in the Lord your God. The word there is not just like I think about it, I, I believe it's there, but it's all about trusting. It's about placing my trust in. And so Paul and Silas are telling this jailer, you have to place your trust, not in us, but in Jesus. You have to trust in Jesus and then you will be saved. And this is this really powerful and profound reminder that trust leads to salvation. Specifically, trust in Jesus. Trust leads to salvation. How do you get saved? You have to trust. Trust God. We're going to wrap up the story here, at least for today's purposes, with verse 32. As we hit verse 32, we're told that Paul and Silas then spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And this is so cool. This is such a cool thing because he knows he needs something. But he's not a Christian. He's not even a Jew. And so he doesn't have any foundation for what he needs. And so not simply do they just say to him, believe and you'll be saved. That would be really cheap, right? That would be really terrible. If you came to me and you're like, I have a real problem, and I was like, I don't know, pray about it, and just kind of walked away, you wouldn't feel very satisfied. And this jailer wouldn't have been very satisfied if Paul and Silas had just said, believe. And so then we're told that they explained it to him. That's what spoke the word of the Lord is all about. It's about explaining what they're talking about, not just to him, but to his entire family. And the fruit of that, of course, is that him and his entire family then are baptized. We're told then they do believe, again, believe not just intellectual assent, but believe, place their trust in God. This is is an awesome thing that there's some work sometimes that needs to be done. When we're sharing the good news, sometimes it's not enough just to stand on the street corner and say, repent, the end is near. Or to leave a little track on a table at a restaurant and say, here you go. Sometimes there needs to be follow-up. There needs to be more work done on our behalf, telling people, explaining the word of the Lord to them. So again, a reminder that the main drive for today, the thing I want you to get out of this, is this good news, this salvation that comes through Jesus is free. It's free for all of us, for everyone. It's a gift given freely with no strings attached. It has no cost for you. But as we're gonna continue to talk about it, that doesn't mean that you have no part to play, that you don't have anything to do. But just to make sure that everyone gets this really clear, the Apostle Paul talks about this more, right? Not just in the book of Acts do we hear a story about Paul and this being free, but we see him make it really clear in the book of Ephesians. It's a little bit later in your Bibles. It's a letter that he wrote to a church that Paul helped start in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, he puts it this way. He says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul wants to make sure we all really, really understand that grace is a gift. It's given freely. We didn't do anything to earn it. We can't do anything to get it. It's given to us freely. Therefore, if I have it, there's nothing to boast about. Those people were really good at boasting about things that we had nothing to do with. Like, for instance, I'm taller than my son right now. I'm constantly lording that over him. I'm taller than you, as if I had anything to do with being taller than him, as if I have anything to do with his height in about five years when he's taller than me. We're really good at boasting about things that we shouldn't, but Paul wants to make sure we know that when we receive grace, it's not something that we get to boast about. It was given to us undeservedly. Again, though, it's free, but we have a little part to play. And to help explain this a little better, I want to ask you a question and tell you a story The question is, have you ever had an accident that wasn't your fault? This is a show of hands. If the answer is yes, raise your hand high. Online, just comment down below. Yeah, obviously it wasn't my fault. How many of you have ever had an accident that wasn't your fault? Yeah, all right. How many of you are like, none of the accidents are my fault? Yeah, I feel that way. I feel that way. There was this one that I rear-ended a person. I still felt like it wasn't my fault. You know, it's... So look, I'm going to tell you about an accident that really for sure wasn't my fault. It happened in Norwich, New York, which if you don't know where Norwich is, it's, it's north and far away. But I was in Norwich, New York at a Little League softball game. I was the pastor of a church south of Norwich in this awesome town called Oxford, and I was going to watch some Little League softball players who were connected to the church play softball. And I, got, I got into the parking lot, I parked my car, I walked out of my car with my entire family and went and watched softball. And partway into it, there was something that I remembered I needed to get from the car. 
And so I took one of my three children with me and we began to walk back to the car. And as I was walking to my car, I watched a person back their car up and right into the side of my car. <laughs> Like, smash it so hard, like the car went up off its wheels for a moment. It wasn't like just a kiss. It was a full-on crash into. And I'm pretty confident if I wasn't walking to the car, this person may have just drove off. But they saw me look like, <gasps> and I saw them. And so we exchanged insurance information <laughs> in that moment. Now, the reality is my, my car didn't have, like, any kind of good insurance on it. It just had like whatever the basic liability insurance is. So my insurance wasn't gonna fix it. This person's insurance was like, I don't know, it's disputed, we're gonna take some time, we're gonna send a person over to investigate. So you know how insurance companies are, they never wanna pay. So it took months. Meanwhile, I'm driving a car with like just a busted in passenger side of the car. And I happened to go to a visit with a, just this awesome couple that was connected to the church. They were shut-ins. They literally never got out. And I was visiting them, and while I was visiting them, they had another friend come and visit. And this other friend started picking on me about my car. She was like, man, I didn't want to park very close to you. Your car is a little wrinkly. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, I saw like the passenger side of your car. It looks like you like drove into a train. <laughs> I said, that's not my fault. And so I explained to her the story. And she was like, sure, whatever. I didn't think much of it. I went home, and about a week later, you know, I remember saying to this person, this woman, I remember saying, I just, I don't have like the $500 it's gonna take to fix this. I don't know if it really would have taken 500, maybe, maybe it would have taken more, I'm not sure, but I threw out $500. About a week later, I was home, and we got a letter in the mail, an anonymous letter with $500 in it, and it was, just in my mailbox. Now I found out later it was this lady who was picking on me for my car being wrinkly uh, through sources. But it was this incredible thing. I had never seen her before. I have never seen her since. One interaction where I was talking about how I got into an accident that wasn't my fault and my car needed to be fixed and it was $500. And she sent me $500. Now I could have taken that $500 and thrown it away. I could have taken that $500 and invested it in the stock market or used it to buy groceries. But that gift was given to me freely. No strings attached. No expectation that I would or ability for me to actually do anything in response. I put the $500 toward my car so it wasn't wrinkly anymore. But that's how grace works. It's given to us freely with no expectation that we will do anything, no strings attached. But it's given with a purpose. Grace is free, but we have a part to play. And initially, when we receive that grace, the part that we have to play is to accept it, is to receive it. There are so many people for whom God gives his grace freely, and they reject it. They say, I don't want it. It's too good to be true. It's not good enough for me. It's not right. It's not what I think. They just leave it. The first step is to accept it. Once you've accepted, if you accept it, you have an opportunity. You see, that woman sent me $500. She didn't know me. She didn't owe me. She just gave it freely. And that story has stuck with me for over a decade now. And whenever I can, in whatever way I have the ability, I like to try to be like her. I like to do things that bless people, sometimes without them even knowing I did it. It's not just about accepting the gift that God has given us. It's then about sharing that gift with others. And so if you have received God's grace, if you've accepted it, now you have an opportunity to share it. It can be in big ways or small ways. It can be all the time or some of the time, but remember, it was a gift given freely to you. And so freely, you should give it back to others. Again, today we're continuing to talk about the good news. We're trying to explore what is it and why does that matter. And we're talking about the reality that God's grace is free for all. It doesn't cost us anything. But with that free gift, 
we have a part to play. First to accept it, and then to share it. Pray with me if you would. God, help us to hear this good news, to receive this free gift, that we might find ourselves accepting it for the first time or in a fuller way for the thousandth time. But may we not stop there. Might we find ourselves transitioning from acceptance to sharing the gift that was given so freely to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.